Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, our event, uh, Mauled by the Bear, Understanding the War in Ukraine. Uh, the event today is sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences, the Departments of Language, Lit Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, the Department of Political Science and International Relations, and the European Studies Program. We very much appreciate your being here today, and I especially want to thank our College of Arts and Sciences events team and Colleen Pop because this got uh, uh, thrown on their plate Friday afternoon. And so it's incredible to me that this has come together so quickly and so effectively. I think you're gonna be very excited by this panel and the, the things you're gonna to learn today. Once the uh, panelists finish with their presentations and discussion, there will be the opportunity for those who are in the audience uh, to ask questions. There are microphones at both ends of the auditorium. If you wanna ask questions, please come down to the mic at the appropriate time uh, and uh, be prepared uh, to, to do that. I also simply wanna note, without having any specifics for you, that uh, political science and international relations is uh, planning to do a couple more events over the next couple weeks related to the war in the Ukraine, uh, both a panel with our uh, international relations scholars focusing on the um, uh, dramatic potential upheaval in the international order that this war represents. And we hope in addition a panel or two with folks on the ground in the region, both UD students and some other scholars as well. So watch for that. We'll announce those as soon as we have the details figured out. So with that having been said, I'm going to turn this over to our moderator today, uh, Dan Green, who's Associate Professor of Political Science here at the University of Delaware. Uh, Professor Green will moderate the panel and uh, get us going. So Professor Green. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave, for that introduction. Um, I'm not going to do anything more than really time keep. We're here at the Mauled by the Bear panel uh, today to try and understand the crisis and war unfolding in Ukraine right now. Uh, history is happening, basically. <laughs> Events are shifting. The plate tectonics of human affairs as we speak every day brings new amazing events. As a professor of international relations history, I can tell you that so far the month of February 2022 is probably the most consequential since September 2001. And it may come to rival the earth-shaking changes of 1989-90 when the Cold War itself ended. Here to help us make sense of it all are four UD experts, uh, three on this panel and one virtual. Uh, four UD experts on Russia, Ukraine, Eastern Europe, international security, and international relations. I will be keeping time. Uh, each professor will speak for about eight minutes. I think we might have a, a few minutes of back and forth amongst the panelists after that, but we do want to get straight to questions from a very nice audience. Thank you for coming. Um, as soon as possible, and as we said, we have two mics here for, for coming up for questions. Our first speaker is Dr. Stuart Kaufman in the political science department. He's professor of political science and international relations here at UD. In 1999, he was the director for Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian affairs on President Clinton's National Security Council staff. So if it was 1999, he would be on CNN every once in a while. <laughs> uh, please come up, uh, Stuart, go on. Um, if it's okay, oh, I'm going to speak from here. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, Actually, uh, I would not have been on CNN. Um, I was definitely one of the, the backstage kinds of staffers. Um, anyway, um, I am going to address basically two uh, questions in, in my eight minutes. Um, basically, what is Putin thinking first? And second, how is the war going? Um, so um, on the what is Putin thinking question, um, I first want to say that a lot of what he's thinking about um, is his understanding of history, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but with two historians on the panel, I'm not going to get into that except to say, listen to the other panelists because it's really important. <laughs> um, 
So when, when people try to understand what, what Putin uh, is doing and, and what he's thinking, they have, um, there's a few standard explanations that people tend to trot out. Um, explanation number one um, is um, that Putin is a rational actor and he's responding to threat. Uh, the argument is he feels threatened uh, and so therefore he's reacting. Um, from this point of view, the, the pivotal issue is NATO enlargement, um, which is a process that's been going on for, uh, for close to three decades. Uh, you know, first Poland and East Central Europe joined NATO, then the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Now there's talk of Ukraine and uh, Georgia joining NATO. Um, and um, so you know, the Russians feel that they're being slowly surrounded. Um, and uh, you know, as, as Putin himself uh, has asked repeatedly in various speeches, he's saying, who is this aimed against? Who's the threat supposed to be from? Or is it a threat to us? Um, and on this, on this score, it's very important to notice that, um, which most of the media has not, uh, that President Biden reiterated the, a commitment that Ukraine will sooner or later join NATO um, just last fall. Um, so if there was a triggering event um, that, that sparked this off coming from outside of Russia, that was it. Um, it was George W. Bush who put the idea of Ukraine being in NATO on the agenda all the way back in 2008. Uh, but uh, Biden reiterating it certainly was um, you know, a, a, con a continued step in this direction of making Russia feel threatened. Um, the other sort of threat um, that Putin worries about um, is um, an, an internal revolution. Um, he watched uh, you know, numerous cases of uh, autocrats in neighboring former Soviet republics, Ukraine twice, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, um, overthrown by their own people. Um, as, a, as an old KGB operative, Putin is absolutely convinced um, that this was all organized by Western intelligence. Um, and he thinks he's next on the list. Um, so he sees these threats as being both kind of military political from NATO uh, and you know, internal subversion. Um, so from this perspective, Putin attacked because his back was against the wall. He felt like he had no other choice. Um, theory number two is Putin is a thug. Um, this, is, this sounds simplistic, um, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, if you look at what Putin's demands have been um, consistently, and in fact, you know, even Yeltsin before him, um, the Russian position has long been that they want the ability to veto key Western security initiatives. Uh, basically, when, when NATO or the West does something like the war in Kosovo, the war in Bosnia, um, the, the, uh, the attack on Libya, um, or something like deploy missile defenses in Europe, even if it's aimed against Iran, Russia wants a veto on all that stuff. Right? That's been the con you know, consistent position of the Russians forever, uh, or for 30 years anyway, um, and um, they haven't gotten it. Um, but then uh, you know, Putin has upped his demands even further, um, and it, you know, his recent demands before the war um, were um, essentially to demand a rollback of NATO. So not just no more NATO expansion, but pull it back in the sense of no new military deployments in any of those um, uh, Eastern European member states of NATO. So in other words, it's okay if Poland's in NATO as long as you don't actually do anything to defend it, right? Um, uh, so, um, so from this perspective, um, you know, Putin um, is acting because his attempts at intimidation failed. Threats alone did not work in forcing uh, a rollback of NATO. So he's trying war as a way to divide and intimidate the West, acting as a thug, as a bully, um, trying to intimidate the West into conceding uh, Russian dominance in Eastern Europe. Theory number three, also simplistic but not necessarily wrong, um, is that Putin is crazy. Um, you know, from this point of view, um, the historical views that my fellow panels will talk about are not just wrong, they're unhinged. I mean, they're just crazy. Um, furthermore, um, he, he appears to see himself, um, he seems to have delusions of grandeur, quite frankly. He thinks he's the great leader who will restore Russian greatness. Um, um, he, he's also seen, I'm sure you've all seen this uh, on, on the news, uh, Putin is seen as isolated from, from his advisors, isolated from reality. Um, 
Um, so from this perspective, the interpretation is a psychological one. Um, the war is an adolescent type outburst in which Putin is taking out his accumulated frustrations over all of these geopolitical issues, taking them out on whoever he can, um, which is Ukraine, his advisors, and whoever else. Um, so the reason I go through all three of these is that I think all of them have an element of truth. Um, and that's really important because what works to deal with one of those problems doesn't work for the other two. Um, so uh, what that means is that I don't think it was NATO expansion. I don't think it was primarily what, what Biden did or, or any other you know, Western leader did. Um, this is coming primarily from Putin himself personally. Um, so in that respect, I don't think there's really much uh, Biden could have done to prevent this. Um, so um, question two, how is the war going? Um, in short, badly for both sides. Um, I, the, the media line is that, you know, that Russia's running into more trouble than expected, which appears to be true. They failed to deliver a quick knockout blow. They've suffered some setbacks. Um, but the fact remains that the Ukrainians are outnumbered, outgunned. Kiev is surrounded, their capital city. Um, and I think it's simply a matter of time um, before, um, uh, before they lose the conventional war. Um, before that happens, there's likely to be urban fighting, um, which is likely to lead to mass civilian casualties. So brace yourselves. Um, my expectation is tens of thousands of people are going to be dead, um, um, and millions of people will be refugees uh, before this even quiets down, right? It hasn't even begun to reach its peak of military intensity. Um, if there's a guerrilla phase, um, oh, so you know, what this means is, is mass artillery bombardment and aerial bombardment of cities. Um, if there's a guerrilla war phase, the scale of atrocities will get even worse. Um, and um, you know, unfortunately, I don't see any way out of this other than through. Um, and that means all of these horrible things are going to happen, um, and then you're going to have a frozen conflict of some sort, like of the sort that are in other uh, parts of that region, um, and with guerrilla warfare continuing for who knows how long. Um, so um, as, as is my want, I'm pretty pessimistic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stuart. That was perfectly on time. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Holly Myers. Dr. Myers is an assistant professor of Russian and chair of the Russian language program in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, where she also teaches Russian language from beginning to advanced. Her research focuses on Soviet and post-Soviet cultural narratives of war and violence, including the Soviet-Afghan War and the ongoing Syrian Civil War. So she'll maybe be able to tell us interesting things about the Russian military. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So. Um, Continuing the line of thought about Putin and the arguments he's making and why and how effective they are, um, you know, he's enlisted cultural texts, right, and made cultural arguments to justify his invasion of Ukraine. And he's been building this up over the last several years. Um, but I don't think that these arguments, as much as he might want them to explain or justify his action, actually do explain what he's doing. And in fact, maybe unexpectedly for him, are undermining, um, are undermining him in his own country and leading in part to the protests of thousands of Russians uh, in cities all across Russia. So, you know, my, my cultural perspective um, on the uh, cultural interconnectedness of the Russian and Ukrainian people and of the cultural significance in particular of that city, Kyiv, um, it's not meant in any way to excuse or explain his decision to invade Ukraine. Um, but, you know, there have been some questions I've heard about, you know, so, well, why wouldn't Zelensky leave Kyiv to move further west to Lviv, you know, and why, if you're paying attention to the Russian language media, is there zero mention of the, uh, the Russian army in Kyiv and bombing and shelling Kyiv, unless that's changed in the last few hours, that's been, um, what I've noticed in the Russian language uh, state-sponsored media coverage of Ukraine. So in his spoken and written commentary on Ukraine, Putin will sometimes publish articles um, on the Kremlin website, um, as well as give hour-long history lesson speeches. 
He refers to ancient legends that are recorded in what we call in English the primary chronicles, but it, or in Russian are the povest vremenich vet, the tale of bygone years. And um, you know, it may seem a sort of arcane reference to us, but it's something that ch school children study in Russia as early as grade six um, and then return to throughout their years in school. So it's a reference that would be immediately familiar to and resonate with uh, Russian uh, audiences that he's speaking to. So I want to give a little bit of context for this, this text and also speak to um, the significance of Kiev uh, culturally and spiritually to uh, Russians. The earliest extant manuscript for this uh, document is dated 1377, but it began to be compiled in the 12th century by monks in Kiev. So it's very, very, very old. Um, and it begins, quote, these are the narratives of bygone years regarding the origin of the land of Rus, that's the name for mid the medieval Russian state, Rus, the first princes of Kiev, and from what source the land of Rus had its beginning. And so from there, we get the history of the Slavic peoples, um, actually connecting their story all the way back to Noah, um, and then on yeah, to Andrew the Apostle, who stopped uh, on his way to Rome to look at some hills and proclaim, so shall the favor of God shine upon them, that on this, city, on this spot a great city shall arise, and God shall erect many churches therein. He blesses the hills, sets up a cross. This is Kiev. This is what will become Kiev. Uh, later on, three brothers found the, a town. They name it Kiev in honor of the eldest brother. Um, at this point, though, the Slavs, are, they're still pagan. Um, later on, Prince Oleg, known as Oleg the Prophet, Oleg the Wise, he's ruling in Novgorod in the north, and he decides to go with, uh, with some Russian troops to Kiev to make it the mother, quote, the mother of Russian cities. And this is a quote that Putin, you'll find in many of his speeches, he'll refer to Kiev as the mother of all Russian cities. So this is where that line comes from. Um, and thus it was said that Prince Oleg unites the Eastern Slavs. And the Eastern Slavs, this is a, comes from a linguistic categorization that refers to the, the Russian language, Ukrainian language, and the Belarusian language. Those are the East Slav languages. Um, so Oleg unites the Eastern Slavs in this new center of uh, this political and cultural center of Kiev. And then, and then this is significant, and 988 is the year um, in this text that Prince Vladimir finally decides to convert the pagan Slavs to orthodoxy, and this happens again in Kiev. It happens in the river Dnieper. There are famous paintings from the early 20th century of the, the conversion um, ordered by Prince Vladimir, and you see the river that runs through Kiev today um, with uh, you know, old people, women, men, children, all in this river being baptized and being converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, and so, this is also, this is why Putin would refer to Kiev so many times. This is why he would refer to the shared history and religion of the Russian and, and Ukrainian people. Um, it is not only in this text, it then reappears in, in Russian literature that's also studied extensively in schools in Russia. To give one example, um, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, I can't not talk about Pushkin, of course, this, uh, the Russian Shakespeare, he's called. Um, he is the, the founder of modern Russian literature at the beginning of the 19th century. He, there are statues to Pushkin in every city in Russia and in Ukraine and in Kiev. Um, in 1820, for example, he writes an epic fairy tale about Prince Vladimir um, and his daughter Ludmila. It's called uh, Rus uh, Ruslan and Ludmila. And in this poem, which is set in this ancient Kiev, um, there are the epithets for the city of fair, light, golden dome, golden domed. And very early in the poem, we're told there, as in, in Kiev, is the Russian spirit. It even smells of Rus. And I mean, these are lines that Russians will have memorized, many of them. Um, and so uh, it, it, you know, I can go on and uh, that, that that's the, the symbol of Kiev 
um, resonate so deeply with Russians listening to Putin speaking. And I think that this has something to do, certainly their military and other policy related considerations, but something to do with why um, there are no photos in uh, Russian language state-sponsored media of Kyiv. Um, there, no, there are no reporting of Russian soldiers in Kyiv and what they're doing <coughs> right now, bombing um, buildings. And um, in fact, what you do see, and I, I saw in Izvestia, I think it was, um, there are the so-called uh, debunking of fake news. They'll show photos that in the Western media, news reports of Kyiv being bombed, and they'll, they'll claim that these photos are faked, that they're actually photos of, of uh, Donetsk or Luhansk instead of Kyiv. Um, and, uh, right, and so I think I'll stop there, but just to say that um, this, this, what's happening now in the Russian language state media is in this, this sort of blackout you know, and information about Kiev is at least in part because of the spe special cultural and religious significance that the city holds for Russians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, our next speaker is Dr. David Shearer from the History Department. Dr. Shearer is the Thomas Muncy Keith Professor of History here at UD. He specializes in Soviet and 20th century history and his publications focus mainly on the Soviet era of the 1920s and 1930s. Take it uh, thank you. <clears throat> I have a feeling that after listening to Stuart and Holly, I should just say what they said. <laughs> but I'm an academic, so <laughs> uh, I have to talk. So I, what I want to do is take a few minutes to talk about Putin's vision of the world. Uh, and I particularly, and particularly what I see is a rather significant shift in that vision, which has occurred not just recently, but has come to the fore uh, recently, uh, which I think um, says a lot about why he's doing what he is doing now. Until last Monday, uh, as Stuart pointed out, uh, you know, Putin has played, uh, sort of has put on several faces. He's acted in primarily as uh, in his role, sort of as a calculating strategist in pursuing Russia's interests against perceived threats to Russia, and especially from, uh, as Stuart said, from NATO, from the West, uh, and, and Ukraine, of course, uh, being a part of that uh, alliance. He strongly opposed, uh, has opposed NATO policies of Eastern movement, and especially potential Ukrainian participation in the Western European Defense Alliance system. Putin also has positioned himself as the defender of the Russian uh, populations in Eastern Ukraine, supposedly being suppressed by the Ukrainian nationalist regime. This is part of his idea of uh, uh, Nazis and fascists. Uh, and uh, his, uh, uh, one of his demands, of course, is for the, the autonomy of those two regions. Uh, uh, you might uh, agree or disagree with that. I think there's perhaps some, some logic and some, uh, a kernel of, of truth in that. Uh, but uh, uh, this, was a, uh, uh, this is, was a position that one could uh, at least understand, uh, a rational position uh, with various points that could be discussed in diplomatic and strategic talks. So this was Putin, the calculating strategist. Uh, playing what many people thought was a weak hand rather deftly. Then came his speech last Monday evening, uh, this uh, rambling, feverish history lesson about why Ukraine never really existed as a country. Ukraine, he claimed, was an artificial creation of early Soviet history, especially Vladimir's original sin, as he called it, of creating semi-autonomous republics within a federation of the Soviet Union rather than creating a unitary state. In his mind, Ukraine had always been an integral part of Russian lands until 1922, when the, Soviet, the new Soviet constitution destroyed the historical unity of Russia and Ukraine by granting Ukraine some kind of territorial integrity. So the very existence of Ukraine, in his mind, is an artificial product of the Soviet Union, of Soviet history. In his vision, Russia should have been reunited uh, with Ukraine in 1991, uh, with the, uh, after the collapse, when the USSR collapsed, he believed that the two 
uh, historically integrated uh, entities should be, uh, should be uh, uh, combined together and of course uh, with their uh, capital in Russia. Uh, but he says it wasn't, he says this in a speech, it wasn't because of corrupt nationalist and fascist leaders who wanted power for themselves. This history, of course, is a concoction. It ignores a number of, uh, uh, of historical realities, such as the, the small fact that Ukraine was an independent state from 1917 and, uh, until 1921, when the Moscow-based Russian Bolsheviks actually conquered it militarily. Just a sort of a slight technicality there. Uh, but Putin did not create this idea. This notion of Ukraine as a historical part of Russia as Holly explained, has very deep roots, uh, going back uh, uh, to time in memorial, uh, but certainly at least back into the, the Slavophile ideas of the mid-19th century. It's even expressed in Russian linguistically of Ukraine as something on the edge, on the periphery, uh, of, uh, uh, if, which sort of literally that's uh, what, you, in the old way, that's how you would uh, uh, talk about Ukraine on, on the edge, on the periphery, which of course begs the question, the edge or periphery of what? Well, of course, of Russia. For those of, of you who are Russian speakers, before 1991, uh, Russians uh, used the phrase na Ukraine uh, uh, to refer to Ukraine, to Ukraine rather than the Ukraine. After 1991, the, Russia, the Ukrainian government insisted uh, that Ukraine be referred to uh, as the Ukraine, that is, in Ukraine, a territorially distinct entity. Mm -hmm. Putin uh, reverted to the old language, na Ukraine, that is to say, the lands on the periphery of Russia. So this is Putin's image of Ukraine, a territory historically attached to Russia, and integral to Russia and Russia's place in the world as a great power. It's difficult for us to imagine the depth of Putin's indignation, the indignation and humiliation of many super Russian nationalists, that sense of loss, of humiliation, uh, uh, having Ukraine taken away from it, bears uh, strong similarities to the insult and the indignation expressed by radical right German nationalists about losing German lands in Poland and, and Eastern and Central Europe after World War I. In the 1920s, the image of an emasculated Germany, and I use that word in all its gendered uh, 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 qualities, uh, they, uh, uh, this image of an emasculated Germany gave a strong impetus to fascist movements such as the National Socialists, who promised to restore the German lands and German imperial greatness. Uh, and we all saw how that turned out. So we see in Putin's speech similar kinds of really rabid humiliation and historical grievance about losing Ukraine. So in his speech, Putin abandoned his identity as a calculating strategist and instead, he stepped into the role and took up the mantle of being once more the glorious savior of Russia, the mythical warrior figure of the Bogatyr, the gatherer of Slavic peoples under the great Russian banner. There was no word in his speech about NATO or Western aggression, only one brief mention at the end about supporting Donetsk and Lugansk. Next morning, of course, uh, uh, after the speech on Tuesday the 24th, it became clear what was behind the speech. Not a military operation to protect uh, these Russian-speaking lands, but a full-scale invasion to recover the lost Russian hinterlands. So this is how Putin now defines himself. Not the calculating strategist, but the Russian warrior gatherer of the Slavic nations. He is defined now by this war and its outcome. This war will define his leg legacy, and he has no choice, I think, but to remain committed to it. F so from this shift uh, in his role or his, uh, his uh, perception of the world, I would draw a couple of conclusions about what may come next. First, I agree with Stuart. The war, will, I think, will intensify. It will become extraordinarily brutal over the next days and weeks. Putin, uh, at least right now, cannot back down. Uh, he will destroy his legacy. He will destroy everything that he's now staked his reputation on. But, and second, finally, 
I think that time is ultimately not on his side. Over the years, Putin has based his legitimacy and popularity on his ability to create economic and social stability in Russia. That has been key to his power. That is now gone. As Russians are seeing before their eyes, within hours, within several days, the stunning and really almost unbelievable implosion of their economy. Uh, what those characteristics are, what, uh, examples of that we can go into. I think it would actually be uh, an interesting part of our discussion to, uh, to talk about the actual economic impact that this war is having in Russia and what that might mean for Putin. Uh, but uh, since I'm, I'm uh, pretty much out of time, uh, I'll uh, end with just one final thought. And that is to say that uh, I share Stewart's uh, uh, pessimism to some extent, but I think uh, in the long run, I think things do not bode well for Putin. The title of our panel is uh, Mauled by the Bear, uh, but uh, it's still not quite clear to me who is going in the end to be mauled. <laughs> by, uh, by this war. So let me stop there and, uh, and uh, um, give it over to Polly. Thank you very much, Professor Shearer. That was one and a half minutes over, but uh, oh. I'm, go I'm, go I'm going to allow it. I'm going to allow it. Um, I didn't see a sign. <laughs> oh, yeah, there was one. Uh, yeah. It's okay. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Uh, coming to us uh, via uh, Zoom is Dr. Polly Zavadivker. She's an assistant professor of history and director of the Jewish Studies program here at UD. She's a historian of East European and Russian Jews in the era of the two world wars and teaches modern Jewish history, the Holocaust, and comparative genocide. Take it away, Dr. Zavadivker. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, glad I can be here via Zoom. Uh, Thank you all to all of the panelists for all your important remarks. Um, it's really an honor to follow up on them. Um, this invasion, watching the citizens of Ukraine fight for their existence as a country, this is very personal uh, to me. Uh, my parents and my sister were born and raised in Kiev, and my, my family has lived in Ukraine more generations going back than I can trace and I'm a first generation American. I still have aunts and uncles who are living in Kiev right now and have been regularly talking to them on Skype. Um, also, it was really great to see students come out on the green today and to stand in solidarity with, uh, with Ukraine. So those of you who have personal family connections, I, I can understand this is a very emotional time. Uh, we're here to address some of Putin's grievances to understand why this has happened. And uh, the Russian government has attacked Ukraine on a pretense that the Ukrainian government is committing crimes against humanity and that Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine face genocide. And these are the claims, uh, so-called grievances I would like to address. Um, it's rather well known now, Putin has claimed one of his goals of invading Ukraine has been to quote unquote, denazify the country and to replace the leadership with his, what he means by that is to replace the leadership with his own people. And I wanna take a few minutes to explain why, why this is such a great lie. And as lies go, it's, the, it's a big lie, the, the big lie. Um, first, the claim about Russian language speakers being oppressed is grossly false. These are false atrocity stories. Uh, in fact, Russian speakers in Ukraine, they enjoy greater rights, uh, freedom of speech than Russian speakers in Russia. Um, we also need to understand that the Russian government is, is not just abusing the term genocide, but also mocking the memory of World War II in Ukraine when there really was a genocide. And uh, Soviet Ukraine was decimated under Nazi German occupation between 1941 and 1945. Millions of Ukrainian soldiers died fighting the Germans, and they fought like hell to defeat fascism. Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, has rebuked Putin's claims, and he, his own grandfather, he's noted, was fought in the infantry of the Soviet army during World War II. It is also not widely known, but it is important to know that Zelensky is the grandson of Holocaust victims. The president, in other words, the president of the country that Putin claims 
He needs to denazify his Jewish. Um, at one point, in fact, both the president and prime minister of Ukraine were Jewish, and observers have pointed out that this, is, this has never happened in any country outside of Israel. And I say this not to suggest this has anything to do with whether they're good or bad politicians, but rather just to underscore the absurdity of Putin's allegations uh, about denazification. Uh, I'd like to read to you just a few words. These are a powerful statement uh, written by Timothy Snyder, the historian who I really admire uh, in an op-ed. It was published in the Boston Globe last Friday, February 25th. It is hard to think of something darker than invading a democracy with a Jewish leader in the name of fighting Nazis. When a political leader invokes genocide and Nazis in a way that Putin has done, he is mocking people who actually care about history and insulting people who survived and remember. Mockery of the Holocaust is so shocking that people do not wish to believe that it is happening. But it is happening right now. Um, and a, a final point, and I'll now close here. Um, I, I want to also emphasize it's important not to idealize Ukraine. Like any other country, it has its share of right-wing extremists and violent xenophobic groups. And there are dark chapters in its history too, including its history of World War II, including people who did collaborate with Nazis uh, in exterminating Jews. Ukrainian people can do more to acknowledge and assume responsibility for this and to fight extremism in the present day. But acknowledging this aspect of Ukraine's past and present in no way justifies Russian aggression and the gross mischaracterization of Ukraine or its leaders. And so in closing, I just wanna reiterate, we must support uh, with all our resources, diplomatic and economic and moral and cultural, uh, Ukraine's right to freedom and sovereignty. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, great opening statements. Um, I think we could have time for any responses to each other's points, mm -hmm. um, questions for each other. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has anything they'd like to add or say or footnote. I have one small thing to add, if I may. Um, uh, Professor Shear's point about the, the preposition the versus na, I mean, it seems a small thing, and yet it's very, it's volatile right now amongst Russian speakers. It's become a, um, a, a marker in a way of which side of this conflict your sympathies lie. Um, and and the, it's something that, that Russian speakers, whether they want to say the Ukraine or not Ukraine, feel very strongly about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought I'd add a couple things that didn't come up, but I, I think um, uh, might in Q&A, so I might as well mention them now. Um, one is, what about those negotiations uh, that, are, that's, that happened today? Um, so um, a journalist asked me this yesterday, and he opened it with, um, are these real ones, real negotiations or fake ones? And I said, they're fake ones. Um, so that's, you know, that's important to keep in mind. The purpose of these negotiations is for Putin to be able to say, if, in case somebody asks, well, I offered them peace, I offered them the opportunity to surrender, and they said no, so it's their fault. Um, so yeah, so, so don't put any, any faith in those negotiations. President Zelensky was very clear that, you know, that, that he, he knew this all along. Um, the, the Russians sent a former minister of culture to be the leader of the, of the delegation, right? So somebody with zero negotiating authority, right? Just a messenger boy saying surrender or else. So that's it for negotiations. Um, second thing is when you think about, um, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, Polly made this point, you know, we want to um, su support the Ukrainians in every way we can. On the other hand, um, Putin keeps on making these nuclear weapons threats. Um, and we have to take that very, very seriously. Um, first, he had a, before the war, he had a nuclear weapons drill. Um, then he explicitly said, hey, remember guys, we have nuclear weapons and we're not afraid to use them, um, in effect. Um, uh, and, and then he uh, put his nuclear weapons on alert. Um, now, all of this is just signaling, but what it's signaling is 
NATO, you better stay out militarily at the, at the very least. Um, so we are back in a world where um, an actual nuclear war is not entirely impossible. Um, and everything else that happens needs to, is, is going to be happening in the shadow of that threat. Um, and that, that's you know, something that we've got to keep in mind. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just wait and see what questions come from the audience. I had one question since we have history, culture, and language experts. I read somewhere that before 2014, the number of Ukrainians who identified as Russian was something like 30%. And then after 2014 and the crisis of 2014, 2015, it's now about 8%. Mm -hmm. In that, is the identity fluid enough or are people bilingual or such that you could actually drift more to being proudly Ukrainian and less Russian? Is that, is it, is that possible? Uh, yes, I would say. Um, and it's a, a good opportunity to make the point in case, in case it's not clear that just being a Russian speaker, a native Russian speaker, doesn't mean that you're not, you don't identify as Ukrainian, that you don't want to be Ukrainian and that you don't want, that, and also, you know, it doesn't, being a native Russian speaker doesn't mean that you want to be part of the Russian Federation. Um, it is. And maybe as one, you know, just small uh, cultural example, if I may, um, what's happening with television right now in Ukraine or since 2014 is, is really interesting. Um, Ukraine is, uh, after 2014, banned um, any Russia-created content to be, new Russia-created content to be um, broadcast in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine continued to make Russian language television content that they would export to Russia, um, but they had to be very careful. Um, some of the bans on the Ukrainian created content, while Russian language was not allowed to show any um, Russian military police officer uniforms or Soviet uniforms, and they, there was a, a list of Russian actors who were banned from participating in the Ukrainian created Russian language television content for saying, um, being too outspoken about anti-Ukraine, with anti-Ukraine um, propaganda. And um, just there's just one uh, TV show that I think really illustrates this point that was made in Ukraine called uh, Good Cop, Bad Cop, Plahoy Haroshi Kop. Um, and the, and I, I just copied the blurb for what it, the description is. Um, Bad Cop, Good Cop, it's a de detective action series about how the new police and old police get along. Uh, the representative of the old schools performed by a famous Russian actor, Yevgeny Sidikhin, um, and he is the experienced expert on the criminal world, but also knocks out evidence and takes bribes. The representative of the new police, who has modern investigative skills, is played by a young Ukrainian actor, Volodymyr Zayets. And together, they will have to solve a complicated case. But which of them will turn out to be a bad cop and which one a good cop? So this is the description of this TV series on this Ukrainian, um, you know, the, the production company's website. And it wasn't very long lived, but it did air in Russia as well as in Ukraine. But do you have more? Yeah, just one, one point, I guess. Uh, yes, your impression is, is correct. Uh, it's difficult to know what percentages, uh, what percentages might be, but uh, the annexation of Crimea uh, did, uh, in fact, increase uh, Ukrainian uh, feelings among Russian speakers in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I would also say that it, in the last uh, month, no one has done more for, uh, for uh, mobilizing Ukrainian sentiment and nationalism among Russian speakers in Ukraine than Vladimir Putin. Absolutely. And especially now. The, 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 the clips you hear coming the, from uh, Russian speakers in Ukraine, they're, they're, you can hear them over the translation. They're speaking in Russian. Uh, and they, they mince no words about mm -hmm. what they think of this invasion. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other, I keep getting tangled in my mask. Uh, any other points from the panel? Dr. Zabedivka, are you okay? Wherever you are. 
in space. <laughs> Out in the ethernet. All right, well, I, don't, I have more questions, but I think we should turn to the audience. We've got uh, about four, half an hour left. So if you would like to ask a question, come up to either mic. Um, I guess we're not just gonna raise hands type of deal. Um, and uh, yeah, it's always good to have a question from students first. Uh, <laughs> from the X-Files, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. My <laughs> question is, do, you th do any of you think another country will be next in the line for, P for an invasion from Putin or is Ukraine such a unique set of circumstances that it would not be really possible for him to like say, I want to invade Lithuania or Poland because thousands of years ago we were once one big country but now we're not. Do you think the same thing could happen with another country or is Ukraine kind of just a unique case? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll take first crack at it. Um, uh, I would say that, um, at least in principle, um, it is entirely possible. Um, it's, you know, I would start with Estonia and Latvia as being next on the list because there's a large number of ethnic Russians um, in those countries. And of course, they were part of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, he's also got designs on uh, Moldova, whose separatist region is, is, is uh, Russian speaking, uh, on Georgia. Um, on the other hand, I think he's going to be, in fact, bogged down in, uh, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he may well have been thinking that, you know, Estonia or Latvia or both was next. Um, but um, but I, I don't think, in fact, that's going to happen because things are not going well for him in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would add that there's a significant difference now between his aspirations and his capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and unless he has really become delusional, uh, he uh, it also, and especially given the last few days, the idea of him going up against uh, a NATO uh, uh, just seems to be uh, out of the question. Mm -hmm. But that does leave open Moldova, Moldova as Stuart said. Uh, there's, uh, there are still, uh, and, and there are actually, there's a, a Russian division that's still stationed in, in Moldova. So that's an easy target, and it's just straight across straight west from uh, Ukraine. Um, th there's still the frozen conflict in Georgia as well, uh, so that's also a possibility. But I, I agree with uh, Stuart that uh, the, 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 northern, uh, the northern areas are, are pretty much blocked by NATO. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I keep wondering, is he going to invade Finland? <laughs> uh, uh, and that's actually, again, you know, Putin is sort of uh, cutting off his nose to spite his face in, in, in all of this because uh, 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 now there's a, a sort of increased public discussion in Finland about joining NATO. Hmm. And who's responsible for that? Hmm. <laughs> Volodya. <laughs> yeah, so. Are, are you not thinking about Kazakhstan, which also has a large ethnic mm -hmm. Russian population, particularly in the north, yeah. right, where the yes. Russia border is and is, has lost, you know, its longtime dis dictator, and it's not exactly a democracy, but there are <laughs> protests and Russian troops were sent in yeah. not long ago. Was... Yeah. So I'm personally, I'm counting on Russian racism to, to uh, solve that problem. Uh -huh. um, a friend of mine did a, did a you know, did a study of, of um, you know a lot of, of potential uh, irredenta um, in in East Central Europe and found, for example, that Romania um, doesn't want Moldova because it has too many Russians in it, uh. um, and um, the the Hungarians don't want Transylvania because there's too many Romanians in mm. it. Um, so similarly, I don't think the Russians want Kazakhstan because I think they think it has too many Kazakhs mm. in it. <laughs> Well, actually, Kazakhs are a minority in Kazakhstan. Um, mm. uh, but that, you know, still, uh, th there are the northern regions, and uh, they do want that space station back, I think. Right, yeah, <laughs> so, Baikonur. Right. Baikonur. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's keep moving with questions, because hurrah, hurrah, we've got plenty. So you're next. Hi. Um, so considering that this is a lose-lose situation for Putin either way, and that there is a mass amount of uh, anticipated deaths with the war. If any, will there be any intervention um, from any countries uh, like the United States or Europe? Um, 
because there is an anticipation of so many deaths, like what is being done to help prevent that? <laughs> It's an excellent question, and you know the answer is you know it depends on what you mean by intervention, right? Um, so there's lots of intervention with you know economic sanctions and diplomatic pressure and and uh, you know public diplomacy and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there can't be military intervention because of that nuclear threat, right? There's this threat of nuclear escalation. Um, so the um, as I like to tell my students, you know the 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 main rule of not blowing up the world uh, during the Cold War was our varsity doesn't fight their varsity. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, so you know, uh, NATO troops directly confronting Russian troops would be, uh, you know, the potential for World War III. So, direct military intervention is off the table, um, and you can't send peacekeepers for a variety of reasons. One of which is peacekeepers don't help very much when there's no peace to keep. Um, and second of all, who would send them into that situation uh, when there's no peace to keep? Um, so yeah, so the, 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 the kinds of intervention that are gonna happen are gonna be the non-military kinds. Um, and unfortunately, that, you know, that's why there's gonna be millions of refugees, right? Because people are gonna be wise enough to run for their lives. I, I might just say one thing. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not entirely, I mean, this is a completely fluid situation, but it does seem to me that, um, uh, and, and Stuart, I, I agree with you, but uh, I think coalitions could be put together at least to, um, uh, to dominate airspace, to make Ukraine a no-fly zone. Uh, that would be, that would not be putting military troops on the ground, uh, but it would be a palpable threat and I think help change the balance of power. And uh, that doesn't have to come from NATO. That can come from uh, any number of uh, uh, countries uh, willing to join a coalition. Uh, I, it would be extremely dangerous and risky, but uh, I, I would not be surprised to see something like that uh, uh, start or emerge uh, if the fighting becomes very, very brutal. I would assume that there are a at least some covert ops going on. And I think yeah. the, the main way that Ukraine is going to be supported is with amazing flow of weapons mm -hmm. uh, and javelin anti-tank missiles and, and air anti-aircraft missiles. So, um, and that is proving very effective. Um, and I'm assuming that there are special ops people from NATO countries in there as well. So you touched briefly on the topic of um, what the, the Russian economy, um, how the Russian economy is suffering from this war, mm -hmm. um, and in particular how you know Putin's base of support has the potential to be um, damaged as a result of the sanctions and other various economic actions of other nations and the international community against Russia. Mm -hmm. um, in the case that you know Putin does lose popular support because of this. Would the will of the Russian people actually be enough to like change how the Russian government is acting? Um, and then, kind of alongside that point, I guess, like, if it, if the um, you know Russian government did in fact respond to the people's um, will, then is there any actual reasonable way for Russia to back out of this without Putin completely losing face? Uh, I don't think it would. Well, uh, it, if, if there are if. If, uh, if, if mass demonstrations really overwhelm the police, that, that's one thing. But my feeling is that uh, initially the movement would not be, would not be uh, coming from, uh, uh, from um, uh, mass protests, but coming from uh, elites within the regime who uh, see, see their, their empires, everything else simply collapsing in front of their eyes. Uh, and who sort of break that code of silence and, uh, and, and come together to decide that something has to be done. Mm -hmm. So I think it would probably start with that. It would be, I would imagine, more a kind of a palace coup or mm. uh, something like that. Then, uh, and, and then, of course, if that, if that begins to happen, that'll unleash the, 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 the mass support on the streets. And then it's anybody's guess what might happen after that. Mm -hmm. Next. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, again, thank you all for your time and expertise. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, but the, the main question I was having is, um, why is this happening now? If, if Ukraine has been flirting with, with NATO, uh, joining NATO for years, and if, if Putin has long held views that Ukraine should be, should be part of Russia, um, why, why did this intervention uh, happen at this point? Is it because Putin was assured that the US or NATO wouldn't get involved, or that you know, we were too divided internationally? Um, so you know, why, is, why did the, the dominoes start to fall now, really? I got, I got a couple of, of uh, guesses on that, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it's, it, reading somebody's mind, you're, you're always guessing, right? Um, so um, theory number one is, again, it's the fact that, um, that uh, Biden did double down um, in last fall on the idea that Ukraine will someday be in NATO. Um, if he had, you know, and this was in a, in a new uh, formal agreement between Ukraine and NATO. Um, so, um, so that was, that's uh, uh, issue number one. Um, issue number two is COVID. Um, you know, two years of Putin becoming increasingly isolated uh, from, um, from, you know, reality, from the rest of the world, from his advisors. Um, and it, se it seems to have changed his mentality. That's what people who watch really closely um, are saying. So it's a combination of, you know, he was angry and, and you know, frustrated anyway, and then, you know, we got another, an, another prick. Mm -hmm. and, and why February 24th, he had to wait until the Olympics were over so that he didn't irritate his friend in China, but it needed to happen before the mud thawed in Ukraine. Uh, interesting point about that. Um, the, they're having a, uh, an unusually warm late winter, and this is now has presented another disadvantage for the, the Russians that they, uh, they're essentially um, roadbound mm -hmm. now, and, uh, and that makes them easier targets. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, uh, as Holly also pointed out, the, 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 the timing has to do with weather and Olympics and those kinds of things. Why he has suddenly changed this persona I, you know, as, as Stuart says, it's anybody's guess. And why, uh, other than that, wh why now? Why not wait for a year or something like mm -hmm. that? But um, I, so I guess there are some longer term issues and also uh, some short term circumstances. Mm -hmm. I saw an argument that um, he got a big boost from. Uh, uh, Polly wants to say something, I think. Did somebody turn on her mic? Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very strange to see myself projected on the wall of the recital hall. I look like big brother, um, big, big sister. Um, I just, I want to make the point, uh, reiterate, I, I think what Stuart said that, you know, Biden could have uh, made a reassuring statement that the uh, Ukraine would not join NATO, which everyone knew. I mean, what if he had done that? Things may have been different. I, 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 I'm not a political scientist, but but we have to think about like wars are not inevitable. I mean, they happen for certain reasons. They're the product of human decisions. And um, when we look back on this, I know it's unfolding now and we offer debates and theories about why, but um, we're, we're going to have to look at our uh, American diplomacy and the failure of our own side to have prevented this. Uh, I just want to make that point. That's a good point. Very good point. My small point was that I read somewhere that uh, Putin got quite a kind of public relations boost after the annexation of Crimea in Russia from right. Russian nationalists, right. and he was going to annex the uh, eastern part of, of Ukraine and get another boost mm -hmm. in time for the 2014, 2024 elections in Russia. I don't know if that's plausible, but uh, a political reason. Uh, my question is, um, with the West seemingly being more and more unified, you know, with Ukraine petitioning to join the EU, Finland considering joining NATO, and we've said in the past during this panel that this is the turning point. It could be kind of like September the 11th or the fall of the Soviet Union. And it's kind of, are we heading for that new East versus West Cold War-esque era in history? Or is it too early to tell considering he invaded, what, five days ago? Do we know? And 
what can we do? Um, I, I think the short answer to that question is yes. Um, um, uh, uh, last time I gave a public lecture on Russian foreign policy was five years ago, and I said then we were headed for a civil war. Uh, sorry, for, for, for a new Cold War. Uh, sorry, civil war is, is my other research agenda. Um, <laughs> um, I said then we were headed for a Cold War, and I, I, you know, I stand by that. I think I was right then. We were in a Cold War before, but kind of weren't paying a lot of attention to it. Um, but you know, if there's any doubt, um, I think you know, Germany's recent decision to massively increase their military spending, um, along with the, the measures that, that, uh, that Biden has taken, um, has definitively you know, determined that, yeah, we're, we're, we're in a new uh, Cold War. This one's different from the last one because um, in the last Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union was the more powerful adversary and China was the more aggressive one. This time, China is the more powerful adversary, and Russia is the more aggressive one. Hmm. Um, but it, you know, it's a very similar lineup. It's you know, this is this. We're, I, in my view, we're we're already, you know, we're not even at the beginning of Cold, of Cold War II. We're several years into it. Hmm. I, I guess as a follow-up, do I need to be concerned, or just not until the bombs start falling? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I mean, so my answer would be, that's why I think it would be an extraordinarily bad idea um, to pursue uh, Professor Shearer's idea of a no-fly zone, right? That's the kind of thing that could cause those bombs to start dropping. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, it, you know, we got through 40 years of Cold War without the bombs dropping. Um, you know, the uh, leaders of both countries said very explicitly, um, nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. Uh, I, I think that's pretty much a consensus. Um, so, the ch so the chances of, of you know, worst case scenario um, are very, very low, um, but only as long as everybody's very careful. Um, and it matters an awful lot um, you know, who's got their finger on that button, both in the, in, in the White House and in the Kremlin, if you think about who recently was in the White House. Mm. Well, in that case, Russia is perfectly safe. <laughs> um, I would just uh, add to that that um, uh, I agree with Stuart. And I think we, we, we've been in a Cold War, uh, and I think it will continue unless there is a, a real political collapse, economic and political collapse in Russia. And then, uh, then it's going to be something like 1991 all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I don't exclude that as a possibility, actually, if, uh, especially if Putin really does continue to pursue the, his delusional ideas. Uh, he, it, and as I guess I would say to uh, Professor Kaufman that the bombs are already falling. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what Putin may do with, uh, with his nuclear weapons. So I keep seeing reports on the news of the Russians using mercenaries from different areas of their country, such as in Chechnya and other places, and they've been using them heavily in Ukraine. And I wanted to ask, why do you think that they're using these troops so, uh, so much? Is it to try and like uh, tie in these former separatist regions of Russia into this cause and this war? Or is it because these soldiers don't know the Ukrainians and they will be more likely to fight more effectively? Huh. I hadn't really thought about that question, but uh, I, I, your supposition, I think both suppositions are, are uh, good. Uh, I think also uh, it's interesting to see where the, uh, the Chechens are. They're located mostly in Lugansk and Donetsk. Um, and uh, they are particularly brutal uh, against uh, Ukrainian speakers. And as a result, uh, I think there's a combination of reasons for that, that um, it's, not, it's not Russians that are inflicting uh, uh, these, this, these kind of brutalities against, uh, against fellow Slavs, it's Chechens. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something, there, I think there is something to that. Yeah, there are. A, sh a lot of conscripts I've read about also being sent to Ukraine. So there's still uh, mandatory military service in Russia. Uh, men aged 18 to 27 have to serve for two years unless they have some sort of exemption. Um, I've seen a percentage as high as 40 percent 
of the troops, the Russian troops uh, being sent to Ukraine, are these 18-year-old, you know, young men, um, some uh, called up as recently as December, according to some of the independent Russian language media, and being um, actually some of them pressured into signing a contract so that they're not on paper conscripts. But in reality, that's, that's what they are. Um, and then being sent to Ukraine, not knowing what they're doing, not wanting to be there. Um, and there's a, you know, a, a well-established committee of soldiers' mothers in Russia that goes back to the end of the Soviet Union, the, the Soviet-Afghan war. Um, after years of mothers protesting their sons being, and daughters being sent to, well, their sons being sent to Afghanistan in the Soviet-Afghan war and dying for what, right? No one could understand why their sons had to die in Afghanistan. And, um, and this committee is still active. It was especially active during the Chechen wars in the 90s, still active now, and is trying to fight this and protest this, that the, these conscripts, conscripts being sent to Ukraine. The, uh, go ahead. Um, Dr. Kaufman, you had previously said that um, Putin's blatant show of nuclear weapons was a warning against NATO's involvement in the conflict. Um, do you think that um, President Zelensky's uh, recent signing of a EU application is going to affect the war uh, similarly? Uh, no. <laughs> in short, um, you know the you know, uh, Ukraine can ask to join the EU. Um, but that process takes years. Um, so it's, it was, you know, at this point, it just has the effect of being a political gesture. I mean, it's a great question, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's just the start. And, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think Ukraine being a member of the EU is realistically on the table until, you know, all of these issues are resolved, um, which for practical purposes means not for a very long time. Uh, good afternoon, panelists. I am a uh, U.S. Army nuclear and chemical weapons expert, and I've served with NATO troops in Germany for a number of years. Um, taking the, the very viable threat seriously of the Russian nuclear threat, how do you suggest uh, NATO and specifically the United States going forward after the, these trying times? Um, well, you know, you know as well as anybody um, what, uh, you know, what's at stake. Um, but you know, the, you know, the, the answer it, it can't you know can't be anything more specific than just be very very cautious. Um, you know the um, you know if you know if if we're right that um, um, that a seemingly benign move like reiterating a a a, a, uh, a promise to Ukraine to join NATO, if we're right that that was a, an important triggering factor in the war, which again not clear, but it might have been. Right. What that proves is precisely that you never really know for sure um, what's going to be the thing that's going to, you know, kick off a, you know, an escalation. Um, so, um, you know, so, you know, the answer is, from, from my perspective, is simply to take it very, very seriously. Um, I saw on you know, the news, uh, you know, some congressman being interviewed and saying, um, uh, well, um, you know, Brushing off the nuclear threat, saying um, that that just proves that uh, that Putin is is uh, is is getting frustrated and he's not getting what he wanted, um, but that's actually the very reason why you have to take it seriously. Um, so I I think you know the moral of this story is um, is restraint. Um, so you know that's the, my one word answer to your question. Hmm. Uh, I think that for, first of all uh, in response in, in, uh, how should nato respond how should the u.s respond i think uh, that um it, it, uh, as i as i said i think in the long run time is not on putin's side uh, but uh, the, the the he needs a way out uh, he needs to be given a way out and if that way can be found I think it could be found in um, 
it is, this is going to take some vision in a reconsideration of the whole security system in Europe. Uh, and that could start with uh, a de facto recognition or a de facto declaration by Ukraine uh, of its neutrality, which, which could actually place Ukraine in a, a, a tremendous position of being able to, to, buy, to play both sides. I mean, I don't think that's, a, like, that's necessarily giving up something. Uh, I think it puts Ukraine in a very strong position. Uh, and it, it, from that point, it seems to me that, uh, that then step by step, carefully, cautiously, uh, perhaps a, 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 a new security system in Europe could be, uh, could be created. I kind of think that they missed that opportunity in 1991. I, I, I think NATO lost its uh, function in 1991, and a whole new system should have been put in place, uh, should have been rethought. But of course, uh, that would require a real vision and political will, which, uh, which hasn't been there. Uh, and now things are building up again to the point where no one can back down. Um, but if, if they can open that door with, with, the, with the, 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 the invitation to say, okay, let's talk about neutrality, let's talk about uh, a, 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 a new kind of security system in Europe, I think that would help. I just had a follow-up question uh, that I was thinking about. Um, so, so in the late uh, 1880s, I mean, ni 1980s, uh, there was a treaty signed between the USSR and the United States of a nuclear weapons reduction. Uh, I believe everybody knows about that. Do you think that treaty would be halted as an all-time low between um, diplomatic relations between the Russians and the United States? Wait, wait say, uh, I didn't quite understand the, the final question. Do you, do you think that that uh, weapons treaty will be um, known void oh. now that the relations between the Russians and the United States is at an all-time low? That, up, that treaty has been updated several times, uh, most recently by, uh, by President Obama, um, uh, cutting nuclear weapons even further from, from the, uh, the 1980s levels. Um, so we're now down to, I forget the number, something like 80% you know, reductions from, from, from the height of the, um, uh, of the Cold War. Um, and that, that's still in effect. Um, so you know, that, that treaty is still there. Um, every reason to believe that you know, that's the one thing that the United States and the Russians can still agree on is that we don't want another nuclear arms race. Um, so if anything, I see that as a stabilizing factor. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this wonderful panel discussion. Uh, my question are that uh, for what we've seen on Ukraine, would it shift American focus, American foreign policy focus from uh, Indo-Pacific region to uh, Europe back again, and uh, are there anything can be can uh, previously before the war broke out can be done to, uh, to prevent the war broke out from the Ukraine side? And my last question, pardon me, is that people saying that uh, Ukraine is uh, Ukraine, what happened now in Ukraine can be happening in Taiwan now, maybe later. Are they comparable? Are there any uh, similarity or difference what we can can see between these two cases? Thank you. Stuart, you're the international relations expert. <laughs> <laughs> Pass that buck. All right. So, um, you know, excellent questions all. Um, um, I, you know, I think, I think you know, the, the, the answer to your first question is, is clearly yes. Um, uh, Biden does not want to shift his focus from the Indo-Pacific to Europe, but he has to. Uh, that's, 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 that has already happened de facto. Um, and you know that's just the way it is. Is there a similarity uh, between China, Taiwan, and, and Russia, Ukraine? Sure. I mean, you know, we're talking in both cases about uh, revisionist powers that you know, with Irredenta, they, you know, they say, you know, in both cases, the, the the line of the aggressive power is those folks aren't a real country. They really belong to us, right? Um, so the the position is the same. The, the main difference, of course, um, which is not in Taiwan's favor, um, is that. Under international law, the Russians are wrong, but the Chinese are right. right? That, you know, Taiwan is not recognized as an independent state by the United Nations or most of the international community. Um, so you know, are, the, are, the Chinese, you know, are the Chinese watching all of this very closely? Oh, yes. Um, uh, and uh, you know, what, what conclusions they might draw is you know, another conversation. So. <laughs> 
I think we have, uh, unless we're forced to shut down, we still have time for some questions. Good afternoon. I've got a um, very breaking news question. Um, CNN about 10 minutes ago reported, and along with the Washington Post, reported that the U.S. is expelling 12 diplomats that are from Russia to the U.N. as a part of the like host agreement. But and also today, Switzerland finally broke mm -hmm. its neutrality. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Because I was pretty shocked when Switzerland broke its neutrality. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that report about Switzerland, and I think uh, it is um, uh, both shocking and I think uh, also uh, if any one country could uh, uh, produce devastating results against Russia, uh, it would be Switzerland. Uh, uh, and by, uh, d depending on what exactly they said they would do, uh, I, it was conf uh, not clear to me whether they had decided to simply to block transactions or whether they uh, were, are considering actually seizing assets. They froze all assets. Pardon? To answer your question, um, they froze all assets. They froze them, but are they going to seize them? Um, that, that's an interesting question. But nonetheless, just freezing them is going to be pretty devastating. But uh, that, of course, uh, that's sort of the icing on, on, on the cake uh, uh, because uh, the, the world financial markets have essentially shut Russia down. And, um, uh, for example, the, the central bank this afternoon said that it no longer had reserves to be able to intervene to stabilize the ruble, which means that then the ruble is already trading at about $1, $1 to 150 rubles. It had been steady for years at about 77 or 78. And now it's 150. And that is creating real panic, real panic in Russia. Uh, in fact, my wife just received an email from a friend in Moscow uh, and said, sir, half seriously, should we be uh, going out and buying toilet paper or sh uh, can we wait? Uh, so, um, uh, I, I, I think, as, just as I said uh, at the beginning, uh, Switzerland now joining this is um, not only surprising, I think it, it's, it's particularly devastating for, for Russia, combined with everything else. Yeah, so, so you all laughed, but I think actually David was serious that, yeah. that uh, yes. you know, when it comes to banking, Switzerland actually is a superpower. So, uh, so it is a big deal. It is a big deal, yeah. Um, and the part about the UN diplomats? That depends on what, on what the given reason was. Oh, uh, I should have clarified that. Uh, espionage? <laughs> well, if it's espionage, then it's espionage, right? So, so the U.S. has the, the sort of the legal justification for doing that, even though they're accredited to the United Nations. And, you know, the timing, of course, is just another signal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how much of an effect that will really have, uh, expelling diplomats. I mean... Um, the, the, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow is already basically shut down. It's the only one. So I'm not sure what the Russians could do in retaliation, but uh, they might expel some businesses or seize some businesses, things like that. But I think the, 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 the Swiss decision uh, is, really is a, a pretty devastating blow. I read in an article recently that uh, uh, Angela Merkel, um, who said that she was um, one of the few leaders in the Western world that talked to uh, um, Putin more than any other world leader because she also spoke Russian. And she said to Obama, and this was long before COVID, that he lives in his own world. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how could we just say that because of COVID, uh, the world view of uh, Putin has changed? Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is, um, in fact, uh, of course, all of us are, are heartbroken of what's happening today in Ukraine. But uh, the Russian side, or the um, uh, foreign minister of uh, Russia, said a few days ago, uh, well, how can you tell us mm -hmm. that we should not go into Ukraine or any other country when the West 
uh, invaded Iraq, invaded Libya, invaded Syria. Basically, all these countries are destroyed, millions of refugees. How can you uh, tell us that we are doing the wrong thing when you did this for the last 15, 20 years, including Afghanistan? How would you answer that to the foreign minister of Russia? Uh, I would say that uh, he is absolutely right, and you are absolutely right. It is hypocritical of the United States. Uh, as, uh, uh, you know, uh, and Lavrov has said, uh, and Russians have said, uh, we're doing nothing more than what the U.S. has, uh, has done. You have your Monroe Doctrine, and we deserve one too. Of course, the, the U.S. is hypocritical on that position by, by saying that Ukraine is a sovereign country and has the right to do anything it wants and you can't invade. So there's a difference, there's a matter of difference here between principle and reality. Um, but uh, principle is principle. And despite, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a justification for the United States saying, oh, okay, the, you're, all, you're just playing by the same rules as we have. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I don't see why, how that could be a justification for uh, not trying to stop Russia. Whatever the U.S. position is, whatever, however hypocritical it is, uh, that doesn't justify Russia's actions, at least in, in, my, in my mind. Yeah, in, in other words, two wrongs don't make a right. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I, you could also you know argue about you know what the U.S. did in in um, Libya, especially in Syria, is nothing like um, what Russia is doing in Ukraine now, or for that matter, what the U.S. did in, in Iraq. Syria is destroyed, but not by the United States. And those were also sovereign countries, even though the United States did not destroy Syria. The Syrians did. Assad did. Okay, um, I'm going to try to make this quick. But um, Professor Kaufman, I took a class, a diplomacy class with you last semester, and like the big question was of like whether or not sanctions work. And I believe in on Thursday when Biden was making his like live address, he was addressing how he was putting like full sanctions on the Russian government. And I know a question a reporter asked is why haven't you put a sanction on Putin if you've only put it on his high officials? Um, why haven't they put done anything about SWIFT? I believe it is. Yeah. Um, which is, I, you wanted to mention before I know like what the economic situation in Russia was. So I wanted you guys to like comment on that. And then really quickly, um, if you think like cryptocurrency will be playing a role, because I know a lot of like Ukrainian activists, um, just like for instance, um, have been receiving some funds like via crypto. Huh. So, yeah. um, great question. Um, so my, my first answer is one of my favorite articles is entitled, Why Economic Sanctions Don't Work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely true that we have to assume that in the short run, certainly, economic sanctions are not going to change anything except to raise the pain level um, in, in Moscow. Um, that said, um, these financial sanctions are sort of quicker acting than most. Um, as, you know, as David's been pointing out, right, the, uh, the fact that the ruble lost half its value in a matter of days, uh, that's, that's a big deal. Um, the fact that, you know, the Russians have this huge... Uh, you know, stockpile of, of, of dollar-denominated um, securities to back up their, uh, their currency, but they hold them in overseas banks where it's been frozen. Um, so, you know, so Putin's been outmaneuvered on that one, right? So, um, so to some extent, these sanctions are, are biting more than one might think, and therefore there's a somewhat better chance that they'll, they'll actually have a short-term impact. Um, on, the, on the SWIFT issue, um, so the United States is beginning to um, move towards shutting down Russian access towards the SWIFT system. Certain banks for certain kinds of transactions, David, you probably know more about this than I do, um, have already been shut off. But there's this giant gaping hole, which is that um, for Europeans buying Russian natural gas, you can still use it. Um, so that's, a, that's gonna be a lifeline for the Russians as long as that continues to exist. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a really complicated question. Short answer is, yeah, sanctions usually don't work. These are a little tougher than most, but still probably won't by themselves be decisive. And Putin has been personally sanctioned now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, last question. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, Russia could retaliate to sanctions via cyber warfare? And would that, if they decide to attack, 
a NATO ally, would that then invoke Article 5? Mm -hmm. Depends I, on what happens. Yeah, I, th I think the short answer is that, you know, any cyber attack will be responded to by cyber attack. Yeah. But it, right, isn't the, the concern that a cyber attack could bleed over into a NATO country and result in some trains falling off rails or something? And right, but still the, the, re the reaction would be in the cyber realm. Yeah, Yeah, I don't think a cyber attack would really invoke uh, or provoke a, a military response. Mm -hmm. uh, it, at least not the kind of cyber attacks we've seen mm -hmm. recently in, in any case. I do want to say that... Um, I've always been pessimistic about sanctions too, I, and, I, and I, I also often I agree that most of the time sanctions hurt the country that's doing the sanctioning more than it does uh, the country being sanctioned. And um, I was skeptical that these sanctions that, that you know the U.S. said they will be fierce and, and swift, and I you know I just kind of think yeah right, we all have heard that before, and the initial ones weren't. I'm sort of changing my view now because I see what's happening in Russia. Uh, these financial sanctions are creating chaos. Mm -hmm. They are creating chaos. There are runs on stores. There are runs on banks. The, uh, uh, the, the, the stock market in Moscow has been closed, has been shut down at least until March 5th uh, in the, on the London market. The, uh, the trading shares of countries such, uh, of uh, companies such as uh, uh, um, Gazprom and others have dropped this day, today, with the beginning of trading today, have dropped anywhere from 40, 45 to 77 percent of their value. Now that hurts. And the people around Putin who have the money and the power, I, I don't know how long they're going to put up with that. Already, they're beginning to, there are cracks. There are some deputies and some wealthy oligarchs who have been saying we need to stop the war, and they've been mm -hmm. saying it publicly. Mm -hmm. So these sanctions, I think, and especially, not just because they're being implemented by the United States or just because they're financial, I think because they involve such a huge number of countries that it really is isolating Russia. And people there now are talking about Russia becoming another North Korea. So uh, I'm I've kind of changed, changing my mind about, uh, about the sanctions that are being put in place now. But I, in general, I, I agree with Stuart that sanctions uh, generally don't work very well. But this may be a different situation. I think we're done. Yeah, Here I comes the boss. Come up quick and say thank you to the panel. And, just see if Polly has any last comments. She's been watching over us, but <laughs> may not have had that much of a chance to speak up. So I'm going to put you on the spot, um, Polly. Any last? <laughs> just, a, um, just a reminder not to confuse the Russian people with the Russian government. Um, yes. The Russian people are, uh, uh, from accounts that I'm hearing, they feel shame yes. uh, for what their government is doing. And uh, they, if you've ever visited Russia, they are so embracing of the West and so embracing of, um, uh, particularly of Americans. And uh, so just to, to remind, uh, remind ourselves of that. Thanks, Polly. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to our panel. Um, I want to let you know there is a, a light reception out uh, in the uh, lobby if you'd like to join us and your questions didn't get asked. Hopefully the, the panelists in the room will be able to stick around a little bit longer to, uh, uh, to talk about that. I want to thank the uh, uh, University Media Services for the live streaming support on very little notice. And I'll thank also the College of Arts and Sciences communications team and the political science communications person, Margot McDonough, for just, you know, again, doing this with no warning whatsoever. Keep an eye out for some additional panels and events that we hope to do over the next couple weeks. And again, join us in the lobby. Thanks very much. <laughs>